Uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, what I'm presenting here is the work of uh, the whole team, so not uh, only mine, and I have a very small and modest contribution to uh, to all of this. So uh, I will try to mention all the names uh, when it comes into the presentation, but uh, if not, uh, please keep in mind that this is a work which lasted for decades in archaeology and for uh, uh, yeah, let's say the last 10 years in geoarchaeology and many people are involved in the different teams from different uh, uh, Turkish, German and French uh, projects. Uh, with Ainos, we are in the northern of the Aegean Sea, uh, at the mouth of the big uh, Hebros River, as uh, Freddy told us. Um, and uh, we are in a city which is both uh, a center for the region of the northern Aegean and for the region of the Straits. Uh, not far away from the Dardanelles, uh, but also a periphery, if we think of the Greek and the Roman world, of course, always centered on the big centers in Asia Minor, Athens or Italy. Uh, what makes um, Ainos uh, particularly interesting is that it controls the mouth of this uh, very big river, which is the biggest river, in fact, in Eastern Thrace, uh, and uh, whose valley was also used as a uh, privileged access uh, into the hinterland, into Trace. Uh, I know it's extremely interesting also because of this very, his very long and rich uh, history, because we have traces of the pre-Greek uh, presence in the region, of the Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Genovese, Ottoman, and finally Turkish city. All this all together, which makes a quite very complicated case for archaeologists, as we would say. From the strategic point of view, as I have tried to say, it is a hub because it controls this navigation way. It is also a hub because it controls the sailing routes on the sea between east and west, between Anatolia and the Balkan Peninsula. And uh, it's important also because it has uh, quite important uh, local resources. So, of course, being a hub of trade, it, contro it controlled uh, the traffic of metals, but uh, on on the on the place it has quite good uh, uh, quality uh, for the ceramics the the, the um, argila is of very good quality and we will see the impact in the economic life of the city and of course it is important because uh, it had uh, communities uh, which, who knew how to take advantage of this uh, uh, maritime and land and river and then marshes uh, uh, environment um, what made me uh, interested in uh, Ainos, it's um, the, let's say, the dramatic character of its history. Uh, because Ainos was extremely important uh, in the antiquity, in any case at the regional scale. So if we think about the region of the Eastern Trace and the Dardanelles Strait. Uh, but also it uh, knew in modern and contemporary times a quite uh, important decay. So now uh, from the a point which control all the roads on the sea and on the land and uh, on the river. Ainos became the end of everything. It's really the really end of uh, Turkey towards west. It is isolated and this is due to um, a series of facts which happened uh, since the late uh, 18th and 19th century. Uh, first of all, the construction of um, the railway which passed uh, north of Ainos. So, um, with this, Ainos lost its uh, connective uh, function and uh, finally with the establishment of the modern frontiers between Turkey and Greece, Ainos was completely cut off its environment, in particular the Samotrake island which is in front of Ainos and with which Ainos always functioned uh, together and also of the other side of the river. So now when you go to Ainos, you can say that you go to the or end of the world, <laughs> because on that road you can go only to Ainos and the city, of course, does not offer many economic possibilities to its inhabitants, except that uh, um, tourists from Istanbul are coming there, the beaches are very beautiful, and uh, people go from there in order to work in uh, Keshan, Edirne or uh, Istanbul. Uh, the man who revealed to the world a very important uh, archaeological uh, uh, finds uh, treasures in Ainos, it's Said Basharan. He, uh, he led the excavations in the city for nearly 40 years. He published um, 
hundreds of articles and books, which are not so well, unfortunately, in the Western world. Uh, uh, even if uh, Saif Basharan was uh, trained in Germany and he uh, is perfectly fluent in, the, in German, um, he published also a lot in Turkish. And of course, it is a need for us as archaeologists and historians to have a very good knowledge of the Turkish uh, language. So what I will present here in archaeology comes from Saif Basharan. And um, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure for me to collaborate uh, with him there. The archaeological finds are extremely rich and for absolutely all the periods uh, in Ainos. And um, we have, of course, remains which are quite impressive from the Byzantine Genovese uh, and the uh, Ottoman times that I will try to show you exactly in the city, uh, center of the city. But the same center was already the center of the previous uh, Roman, Greek and uh, maybe uh, a Thracian uh, settlement. So I will try to show you a small uh, uh, movie of, uh, with, uh, in order you to have an aerial uh, view. So we are living now from the Acropolis, from the city center, which was a city center for the, at least the last uh, 4,000, 3,000 years. And we are looking towards east, uh, toward the road in Istam uh, to, to Istanbul. Uh, here is the, what remains on this uh, Acropolis. We can see mainly Byzantine and uh, Genovese fortifications, which were repair, repaired in Ottoman times. Uh, this is one of the most important basilicas. It is called Hagia Sophia. It's a Byzantine basilica, uh, which was transformed into a mosque after the Ottoman conquest of Ainos in 1456. Uh, then it was destroyed by an earthquake, and now it is restored as a um, mosque. Uh, it will reopen uh, this year or next year. Uh, here we have another maybe late antique or Byzantine basilica, but which we'll talk later because it could be an interesting sign for what we are looking for classical antiquity. Here are other basilicas which are related with the uh, maritime um, environment of the city. So a lot of archaeology from all the times, a lot of finds which are preserved in the Edirne uh, Museum, uh, uh, near the Bulgarian, uh, Turkish-Bulgarian border. Uh, however, there are many things, as you know uh, better than me, which cannot uh, uh, be um, uh, solved uh, by traditional archaeology. And uh, these things, uh, of course, uh, revealed of geoarchaeology and uh, of um, uh, geophysics and geomorphology uh, in particular. First of all, of course, it's very difficult with archaeology to determine the territory of the city. One needs prospections, uh, geophysical prospection, and then uh, it is, uh, of course, nearly impossible to um, uh, see um, uh, the ev evolution of the, uh, of the landscape. Uh, so I was trying to play uh, myself as an historian. If the, here, if you look uh, uh, towards the west, uh, um, uh, you can see the sea and the city, the modern city. So trying to imagine how it was in antiquity and to understand the life of the people. Of course, we need uh, geophysicists and geomorphologists and also looking in the same direction uh, towards the island of Samothrace uh, in order to reconstruct the uh, evolution of the Hebros Delta and uh, the environment. Uh, for this, um, we had uh, several projects, as I have already mentioned. The first was the DFG, uh, the German project, uh, Hefen, um, organized by Helmut Brugner and Thomas Schmitz, uh, with the participation of Wolfgang Rabel from the University of Kiel. So all the geophysics are done by the uh, University of Kiel. Uh, and um, with the participation from Köln, together with Helmut Brugner, of Martin uh, Zelliger. So we will discuss about drills which were uh, drilled by Martin Zelliger together with uh, Helmut uh, Brugner. Thomas Schmidt is a, uh, an archaeologist specialist of maritime archaeology uh, from, um, from Mainz. And uh, after the German project, um, I have organized a French project starting in uh, 2016 and which lasts until the last year. Uh, continuing the geoarchaeological work and uh, heading towards the um, modelization, the fourth uh, dimensional, let's say three dimensional or fourth dimensional uh, reconstruction of the environment of the city. And now, uh, in order to have a um, 
hint uh, at uh, what it uh, is done by Kern, I would like to ask uh, Felix Reise to, to, to present the GIS of drills he did. So, well, as you can see, you just have a open street map of NS right now in the Chronocarto web GIS. And what I did over the last weeks was to make sure we get every location we drilled into this web GIS. So if I click on boreholes, you can see all the drill locations we drilled over the past years. So as you can see, there are quite a lot locations where we drilled. So it's roughly over 160 locations which were drilled, where samples were taken. And it looks a little bit like, like Swiss cheese because there are so many holes. If we click on documents now, we can see that I added some information and some pictures for every drill location. For example, let's go to INOS 37. We're going to click on it and then we'll get a little image. Let's see. I'll speed it up. Oh. Well, that takes some time. Then let's go to INOS 40. Or, well, let's take INOS 160. Uh, and 46. So as you can see now, you get some information about this drill. It was carried out in 2019 and it's eight meters deep. We drilled an open car and the status of the lab work and the analysis which we carry out. So this car in particular was completely lab analyzed. So grain size was carried out, um, microfauna and um, we are trying to establish um, a reliable chronostratigraphy right now. So um, we dated some samples as well. We have a nice chronostratigraphy. If we click on the picture, you can see the, the car, which is quite a nice and interesting car. And so I tried over the last weeks to do the same process for each and every drill which was taken yeah, and since 2013. And in general, this Chrono Carto GIS is really, really helpful to us because as you can see, we have all the drill locations in one, in one map. So we know where exactly we do have samples of, from which location and which location is well sampled, well drilled. And um, we also can see which location is like poorly sampled, so where we have to go next to get even more samples and uh, find out a little bit more about the history of uh, the ancient Ainos. Thank you very much, Felix. And this is very, very kind of you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. So. Uh, what we do out of these uh, drills and uh, geophysics around the, the, the city, uh, the purpose, um, at least in my project CNRS, in the last project, was to try to reconstruct the environment of uh, uh, INOS and the, um, uh, taking into account the evolution of the delta. However, what I must say, as you can you could see from the presentation of Felix, that we had drills mostly here and a little bit uh, here. So what remains to be done is uh, to drill also on the Greek side. Here we are in Greece and farther on in order to understand the, the evolution uh, of the city. However, I have tried to suggest uh, together with the Köln team uh, an evolution of that very theoretical evolution on the delta based mainly on historical sources, text and maps. And it looks uh, a little bit like this. Uh, we are going from uh, 4000 BC, or uh, let's say, when Ainos was an island. And we have now the confirmation by drills and geophysics done here on the isthmus. Uh, then to Greek antiquity, when we have already the starting of the evolution uh, of the presence of the delta. 
in the region of the city, and then Roman times, and then Ottoman times, and uh, a general um, uh, view. Since there is not uh, much time, I will uh, pass uh, uh, over uh, this. Uh, we have tried to make, but you can see very well on the YouTube, uh, a presentation uh, of what it could have looked like in the Greek times, and mainly when uh, the Persians attacked the Greeks in the 4th century uh, BC. And uh, what I try to do here is to uh, uh, translate the Greek text, not only into text, English text, but into real picture. And all this was done based, of course, on geomorphology, uh, palynology, uh, and uh, archaeology, uh, mainly with uh, the establishment of the uh, regions where the different parts of the territory were, like, for example, the harbor here and so on. So I invite you to watch this on the <coughs> internet, sorry, if you are interested, and I'm going quickly uh, farther on uh, in order to have time to make some uh, discussions uh, with you on uh, three main points and to show you why geoarchaeology is so important in Ainos. First of all, why Ainos? Uh, well, I know because it's, um, uh, let's say, medium inter uh, intermediary Greek city. As I told you, it was a hub. It had main, uh, a lot of resources. It controlled the main navigation path from the Aegean to the, to the Thracian land. Uh, but also, as a case, it's extremely complicated because uh, we could not know before starting the project where were the harbors. We did not know much about the environment of the city, uh, in which condition people lived. We only had literary texts, which are particularly fragmentary uh, for this uh, for this region. And uh, from the drills, uh, one of the first interesting results was obtained by Ludmila Shumilovsky, who studied the palynology. Uh, and a look at the environment today, then based on a core which was taken here, or right um, near one of the lagoons bordering today the city, but which was in antiquity uh, still a maritime gulf. Uh, she studied the vegetation history and uh, um, she was the first so to see how the vegetation evolved in the northern Aegean, so starting from Leolithic times when one still has the open oak forest, so characteristic for the northern Aegean. But uh, she was able to see from the late Neolithic and Chalcolithic times the first trace of the human presences, so an open mixed oak forest, maybe through climatic change, but in only case deforestation and trace some small traces of uh, agriculture a big human impact starting exactly in the 8th century uh, uh, BC. You see also here, it's easy to see through the charcoal. So when the Greeks arrived, they cut the forest, they burned the fields, and they made agricultural fields and uh, uh, pastures. And then uh, intensive use, and you see a strong modification of the vegetation in the Roman times also. And uh, finally, a very important impact in Ottoman times, the total transformation of the vegetation uh, in, uh, in uh, Ottoman times due particularly to the rice uh, uh, fields in the delta. Uh, she could see also the vegetation in the uh, water and environment with the same uh, uh, symptoms of eutrophication due to the human presence which fit quite well from the first millennium BC for first millennium BC, uh, first millennium BC for uh, the, the human presence, the traces of the human presence we have from archaeology. So <coughs> when Ainos was an island in Neolithic and Chalcolithic, uh, uh, people, we could not know, we don't know if they were established in Ainos itself, we don't have traces, but uh, we have a very important Neolithic site, which is Hocha Cezme Hoyu, which is established only 2.5 kilometers east of uh, Ainos on a high plateau and uh, having access uh, to very good uh, freshwater uh, sources. Uh, calcolytic presence is uh, tested in Ainos itself. <coughs> Sorry. Hmm. Uh, but um, we don't know to what extent this presence uh, corresponds to the famous Thracians, which are well attested in the Greek sources. For Greek history, Ainos is mentioned as a Thracian a site already in Homer. And um, 
there is a big literary tradition about the wooden city, Poltumbria, Poltus, as having existed in Ainos, from which we have only some shores, but nothing constructed from the pre-Greek times. Here is the very important Neolithic fortification in Hoja Cesme, so 2.5 uh, kilometers east of Ainos. Then going to the Greek times, we had quite important uh, uh, tracing, not so much from the settlement, because the settlement was occupied, as I told you, for 4,000 years. But still, even from there, we have some capitals from the Aeolians, uh, which confirms the tradition about the Greek founding of the city in the 7th century BC by the Aeolians. So this mean population, means populations which are coming from uh, Troas and uh, Aeolis. Uh, in north uh, um, western uh, Asia Minor, but also from the island of Lesbos and the peninsula of Kersonesos uh, in Trace, of course. So, Aeolian um, uh, presence, uh, followed by a succession of uh, uh, many uh, powers, many empires which dominated uh, Ainos. And first of all, I have already mentioned the Persians, which who passed near Ainos and established themselves on Doriscos, so on the Greek side. Uh, then the Greeks uh, uh, themselves with uh, the Athenians, and we have a lot of Athenian finds in Ainos. Then um, we have the Thracian presence and the Odrysian domination over the city. Then we have a Macedonian domination. Then all the most of the Hellenistic kings try to take the cities of Ptolemaic, Seleucid, um, and the Antigonid uh, or even Atalid presence in Ainos, all this we know from literary sources. And then the Romans, which are who are there from the second century uh, BC, followed by the Byzantines, then the Genovese and the Ottomans. Um, for the Romans, the city was important due to its proximity to the Dardanelles Straits and uh, to the proximity of the Ignatia um, uh, road, the um, Via Ignatia. And we have uh, all the time when we are dismantling uh, some uh, reconstructed modern building, reconstructed, we can find inscriptions on the site, like uh, this inscription mentioning uh, the imperial family, so attesting the cult of the emperor in the first century um, AD. We have houses from imperial times, then we have these uh, traces, as I told you about, uh, from Byzantine, Genovese, and Ottoman times. Uh, this is the Burg, the, the citadel. And um, it is complicated to excavate there because uh, of this 4,000 years uh, continuous uh, uh, presence. And an interesting monument I would like to show, it's a cave uh, in which we have uh, uh, first an inscription uh, here, which is like a uh, May tree to the mother. One could think it is uh, the mother of God. In fact, it's the mother of the gods, the Thracian goddess, possibly. Then a relief of Greek, uh, classical times and uh, then uh, the cave was uh, reused as a chapel in Byzantine times and finally as a funerary chapels in uh, uh, later Byzantine uh, and the Genovese uh, uh, times and all this is really near the uh, center of the city. Uh, Geoarchaeology, what can geoarchaeology do in, uh, in this um, uh, region first, uh, it can help us to see things which are impossible to see uh, through archaeology, and this uh, it was the discovery of the city wall. We, you could see from the Acropolis a, a wall which was protecting only the center of the city, but there were also city walls which were before known only from literary text, and the Thanks to the work of Martin Zelliger and of the team of Helmut Brugner and uh, Wolfgang Rabel, geophysicists and geomorphologists uh, work together and are able to see, as you can see here on a field where you can see absolutely nothing. No archaeologists could think before that there is the city wall passes there. So they saw it in geophysics and they confirm it uh, with um, uh, geomorphological uh, drills. Uh, so showing uh, the, the human uh, impact, I'm passing uh, quickly, but uh, the, 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 the city wall is now reconstructed for, for the part of the western uh, side, so towards the sea. And I suggest a comparison with the late classical walls uh, of uh, Mesembria, Zone, an important city which is situated on the same uh, Aegean coast to the west uh, in Greece. 
Um, so these city walls were already known from literary sources. We have sometimes appearing in the text the situation that the city walls of the city were quite bad because they were damaged by the enemies by the sea. And uh, thanks to geophysics and geomorphology alone, uh, we, we, could, uh, we could find it. And uh, now it's up to us archaeologists uh, to excavate it. Then uh, archaeologists uh, were already able, and Said Basharan, it's Said Basharan uh, work, uh, to establish the limit of the urban area uh, by excavating the necropolis. So uh, once again, we are here on the promontory with the burg, which is uh, uh, exactly here. All this must have been inhabited, more or less. And then we have on this isthmus, which was formed so uh, probably only in historical times, uh, uh, we have necropolis all around up to very far away, several kilometers away from the city. And this uh, necropolis, so we don't have to think about them as a city of the dead. It's normal Greek uh, habitat to put the dead people at the gates and around the, the, the roads of the city are extremely uh, rich. And I'm giving you some examples. So just to see here we are on the isthmus. So it's very well, uh, it's very uh, quickly uh, wet if we excavate because of the uh, water, so we have here a lagoon, and here it's the river, and a modern channel of the river which cut the seismos. So the excavation is quite complicated, but the finds are really impressive by their diversity. So we have here uh, Greek, Roman, and up to Byzantine times tombs of all kinds of tombs. So information, incineration, uh, uh, without, with inventory. So it's a huge diversity, and all are one on top of the other. So I'm passing very quickly just to give you an idea. So from a basic archaic, uh, um, you can see here the archaic uh, uh, vases uh, uh, with a huge uh, amount of uh, ceramics of uh, good quality, but also of local limitations. So we can establish the date of the first generation in Ainos by uh, Corinthian ceramics, and this will be in the third quarter of the seventh century BC. Uh, then uh, in the ceramics, we can see the trading uh, influences and connections here, a connection with the Northwestern Asia Minor. As I told you, they are coming from Aeolis, uh, the colonies there. So we have parallels in Northern Ionia and uh, Troas for this kind of uh, uh, vase. Uh, uh, then uh, tombs in sarcophagi with protome also for archaic times. There, since the city has uh, such a good quality of the tone of the argil, argila, um, we have a local production of very high quality of uh, so-called clasomanian uh, uh, sarcophagi. Then uh, a huge variety of vases, as you can see here, tombs in pitoi uh, with information and incineration, incineration in amphoras, uh, quite important quantity of attic materials here with red figures, we'll see also with black figures. Um, we have also incineration tombs in Hydria of all kinds, uh, so in ceramics, but also in uh, bronze. Uh, um, have very nice orientalizing ceramics from the northwestern Anatolia, all kind of cups, huge collection of cups in the Edirne Museum now. Uh, amphora, so Attic Amphora, black figure, red figure, uh, Hydria, Lekitoi, uh, glass uh, with connections uh, through all the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, quite important object I would like just to mention shortly here are some of the things on which I'm working together with Said Basharan because uh, the material, of course, is rich, but it's also peculiar in some cases. Like, for example, for these two cups, Attic cups, on which we could discover some new fragments of uh, Greek uh, poetry from the 6th century BC. Other necropolis with a very interesting find. So here we are at the on the slopes at the gates of, of the city uh, with finds from Roman times which show the same mixture of Anatolian and Balkanic culture and then up to uh, several kilometers away from the city with sculptures, Greek sculptures of the, like this lion and uh, Hydria and Sarcophagi. We also have Thracian tombs, uh, so from the Hellenistic times uh, and uh, very interesting, we have a tomb that uh, uh, we try to, um, to explore through all possible methods, archaeology, geophysics, and geomorphology, but which keeps uh, still all its mystery. Uh, we know that uh, it was considered in the first century AD as the tumulus of uh, 
Polydorus. Polydorus was the last son of the king of Troy, so again the North Anatolian connection, uh, which took uh, refuge to the Thracians, but uh, with all the gold of Troy, but the Thracian king was a bad guy and killed the child in order to take the gold. And uh, Pliny the Elder in the first century AD always uh, already identifies this tumulus uh, with uh, uh, Polydorus tumulus. Unfortunately, we could not find any results, so we tried everything in geophysics, we tried to drill in it, but we could not find any uh, discovery in order to understand the date uh, of this uh, tumuli. It could be a cenotaph, but we cannot say uh, more for, for now. It uh, remains a mythic uh, place. Uh, then, uh, just uh, to, to show um, uh, some things about uh, the, the, what the archaeological bring for the cults of the city. Um, we, are, we are looking for the harbors of the city uh, in Ainos and using all kinds of maps. And we know that Ainos, which was this hub controlling the way uh, in the northern Aegean and to the Hebros, uh, was the city of Hermes. Uh, Hermes is the trading god of the Greeks, but also the god of the fifth. So this tells us a lot why the people in Ainos are so rich in Greek and also Roman times. They were adoring Hermes, which appears, uh, who appears on their coins, very nice uh, silver coins, some of the best quality in the fifth century BC, and also Kalimakos, uh, Kalimakos living in Alexandria, so Ptolemaic interest in Ainos. But we have no clue about where this could be. And it's interesting because this uh, Hermes temple, the main temple of the city, was connected with the harbor. So one um, clue could be the existence of this um, late antique or Byzantine church, which was identified by the Greeks as being of the Hagios uh, Euplos, uh, so the holy god of the navigation, but in a Christian context. Is this a Christianization? We cannot know. So we have to do geophysics around. This area was not explored. We are so in the area of the possible harbor north of uh, these uh, city walls. Uh, so we are going now at the last uh, point uh, of, uh, of discussions, always in order to show you what we can do together only by putting together geophysics, geomorphology, and archaeology. Um, is um, studying the harbors. This was the topic of the first German project of Helmut Bruckner uh, uh, since 2012, and we continue it in Lege Carta. So um, Martin Zelliger and Helmut Bruckner made a lot of drills that you could see in Felix's uh, presentation all around, uh, because if you look uh, at the first time on the map, you could see, ah, okay, in here, where it's uh, written Tashal 2, or uh, here, you should have harbor. So it's very easy, you solve the problems. But when you start to drill, you see that the situation is extremely complicated, and this history of the lagoons is particularly uh, difficult, because um, you cannot find enough water depths for all the times when you would guess to have a harbor, uh, or you cannot find a lot uh, at all uh, water depths. Uh, uh, or you can find it for times which are not historically. So this is why there are so many drills in order to be able to identify uh, uh, the harbor. And uh, of course, I think that the best candidate is this Dalian Gölü, uh, because uh, it is uh, situated here. Here is this burg, this Acropolis, so-called Acropolis, the higher city with the walls you, you could see, and it has a gate uh, bringing here. So one could imagine that this, this region, it was the harbor, at least in Byzantine, Genovese, and uh, uh, Ottoman times, as long as this harbor uh, um, existed. Here a map, so this is the citadel, and you can see here a tower. Here we have another tower, which is not related by a wall. Here, very late uh, Byzantine and Genovese uh, construction, protecting this uh, possible harbor. Um, here are the construction, so you could see the, the wall of the um, burg um, with the different uh, remake of the tower of the of the walls here and here the gate uh, bringing possible to the harbor. Here a picture taken from the harbor towards the the, the city, and here on the opposite direction from the mountain looking towards the possible harbor uh, here. We know from literary sources that the harbor should be to the west of the city, so we have this information from the 6th century AD. So geomorphology started to drill, 
uh, Helmut Brugner and Martin Zelliger did a lot of drills, but then the things get complicated. So they started to drill immediately near these late Byzantine walls, thinking that, okay, so the situation can be like in Constantinopolis. So we'll have the walls going up to the sea, so all this should be the sea, and here we have the harbor. But the situation was bad because uh, for example, here in this point, the harbor could be possible only before historical times. And it continued like that with several drills, which show no good situation for our harbor. So yes, it was marine, but well before the times which interested us. Then uh, this point, for example, yeah, it could be a harbor, but you would have only one, two meters uh, water depth. So it's not good. So this was the first surprise. So where we thought it was the harbor, there was no possible harbor. So we tried to go a little bit farther to the west and did uh, all this. Yes, it was possible to find uh, a harbor, possible also with dredging. Uh, this would justify why we lost all the stratigraphy in the harbor but we could not find uh, any uh, kind before 2019 we cannot not find any kind of archaeological proof that there was a harbor there and for a city as important as Ainos which played such an important role in connectivity on the sea river and so on we should uh, wait for some harbor uh, buildings and so on and nothing came out unfortunately until then, and also we could not prove it that geophysicists from Kiel tried to do a lot of uh, all kinds of methods, water and terrestrial and so on, and nothing worked. Finally, in 2019, we could uh, find, uh, um, we could uh, determine a better position, and uh, we had a drill which shows finally that we identified the uh, uh, the, um, the basin, which is more a little bit to, to the northwest than we could find, but still well aligned in the line with the city gate. Uh, this is the status of the, the, the project now, trying to put together the text we have uh, uh, with geoarchaeological uh, research. Uh, we could imagine that this was always the city center, so the fortified, the higher city. Uh, here we had like uh, free land, maybe with inundation at some point, and here we have uh, uh, the harbor proven until now only by this uh, drill from 2019, which is currently studied by Felix here. My assumption as an historian looking at the text is that maybe the Agora is here and we should look here for this temple of uh, Hermes if it is to be identified with the place where this Yunus Bey Turbase, the small uh, Byzantine church is, um, but we still have to check this is the status of research. In order to identify this uh, harbor, um, I was um, taking into consideration the parallel of the harbor of Tassos, you can see here, which is quite similar. The harbor is very similar, is very close to the Agora, to the center of the city. So Agora, the place where you, are, where you make trade, Ainos connective, connecting city, Hermes, the city of uh, trade, we try to reconstruct this multidimensional space, so natural, economic, and uh, cultural, religious, so to say. Then the question is, we will have here another harbor in this uh, smallest uh, uh, lagoon. This was a strong point in the German project, DFG, uh, because uh, uh, the first sign would be that we have here one of the most important basilicas, Byzantine basilicas in, uh, in Ainos. And uh, maybe it was a fisherman basilica. And in any case, in order to bring here so big blocks, they were certainly brought uh, in the 12th century AD by ships. So uh, very important uh, basilica. People, ancient historians and archaeologists before us thought that the harbor should be there because it's a very nice location. So geomorphologists and geophysicists start to uh, make surveys and to drill and you can see here some very nice channels which look very exciting for some buildings in the possible buildings in the harbor so geomorphologists drilled and they find a, a good situation more or less uh, for a harbor possible harbor in greek times and roman times with a continuity for small ships up to byzantine times but um, when looking for the archaeological proof of the harbor, the situation gets complicated because uh, while doing excavations through these uh, geophysical anomal uh, anomalies, 
uh, nothing would be fine, but absolutely nothing. So yeah, it's a change of color, but there is strictly no archeological remain. So this was quite frustrating, of course, because we cannot prove that it was really a harbor, just a harbor situation from geomorphology. Then the question was, uh, what are these uh, lines that we are seeing there? So we made all kinds of theories. Was this a saline? And uh, these were some kind of dredging uh, channels, but it's sure that we could not find any anthropo anthropogenical material. So my hypothesis of this is that these are simply some channels in order to drain the isthmus of the city. And looking at the Roman road, which passes on this isthmus, I think that we have here this continuation of the dredging uh, channel. So uh, this isthmus, which formed, let's say, uh, uh, 4,000, 3,000 uh, uh, years um, ago, was still humid, and they were making just channels in order to uh, evacuate the water, which could be there in late winter and uh, spring times. So unfortunately, these channels were not uh, the harbor channels, we hope, but simply some dredging channels. Uh, then the, another interesting point for geoarchaeology, and I will try to finish uh, uh, with this, uh, is the studying the road. So I told you that we are on the Roman road here, and we have very, very nice reconstructed uh, the road, Roman and Byzantine. Uh, and this is what the ancient historians think now. So you should be able to pass from Ainos to Trianopolis, uh, Doris Kos in previous times, and uh, here, Alexandropolis uh, in present times, you should be able to pass somehow here, or you should be able to go up to more or less here, Kipsela, Hipsala, and then pass like you pass today to Greece, uh, the border. And uh, the question is, uh, how was here? What was here? It was a big uh, maritime gulf, but what was Ainos territory? How was it organized? What could we say more uh, out, of, uh, out of this? We have, again, literary texts, which attest for a second big harbor, which was exterior to the city, and which would be the Centaurist Harbor. Centaur is a Thracian hero related with Ares. So we are in this uh, same multidimensional space combining uh, economic lives and uh, religion and so on. Um, and on the Tabula Peutengeriana, this 4th century AD document copied in the 13th century AD, uh, we can see very well the uh, roads. Here is the river, and here we can see the free roads going out of uh, Ainosum. So uh, we can do more with uh, geoarchaeology by uh, trying to understand the evolution of the delta and uh, the situation of the territory here. My first hypothesis was that maybe in this area, uh, it is a st this uh, famous Centaurus harbor, which could have been the harbor for the river, at least in some period. So you, I know it would be for the sea, but then from here you can cross the river and you can go up the river uh, to trace. We have all kinds of literary tests uh, uh, and suppositions from the 17th, 18th century uh, AD uh, that this must be a big, um, big um, harbor, but we still have to think uh, about it. We started to drill there in 2019, but we still do not have conclusive um, um, proofs that this was uh, the harbor. Um, this is one of the things I would like, and I, will, I hope we can work together uh, in a collaboration with the University of Bucharest, the reconstruction of the Hebros Delta and uh, the identification of the uh, crossing point uh, between what is today Turkey and uh, what is Greece. Uh, when looking at the, um, at the landscape, archaeological landscape, we can have here uh, the traces of the Roman road following this, uh, this coast up to here. And this shows that here it was a point. We have very nice uh, remains where we did geophysics. We can make an excavation there. You can see here the landscape is very picturesque. And you can see here the Roman road, here the traces of this uh, maybe temple. Uh, again, traces of the Roman roads, which continue up to the city, and traces of some columns, capitals, and so on, marble, maybe a second, first century AD and later. We did geophysics, we could see a big building, but we still have to see uh, what it is uh, there and to make uh, drills uh, in order to establish the character of this site. 
And then we have another site, uh, which is rather here, that could be another temple and the harbor situation in order to cross to the other side. The Via Ignatia uh, was passing to Ipsala, but Ainos had this road and several possible, in any case here, a crossing point and here a possible, uh, a possible um, uh, harbor. So this is uh, Ainos. Uh, and uh, this is our team and sorry for being so long thank you very much for your patience okay thank you very much anka for this wonderful presentation and sincerely i didn't know how how a rich treasure of uh, archaeological data and um, geological information is there and uh, congrats for um, this uh, wonderful work so probably in the next years probably we'll you'll uh, have a lot of publications with all these results because most of them are still unpublished if i yes they that. are they are in published unpublished but uh, we still have to continue the work <laughs> i hope with you in uh, geomorphology uh, because uh, and we'll continue with the kill people in uh, geophysics uh, geophysics because as you can see mm -hmm. the evolution of the hebros delta is the key for the environment and uh, until now we have only just uh, a guess based on literary sources and maps for the evolution of the delta okay so now we start the discussion session of this seminar so each of you are invited to make some comments feedbacks or just uh, questions for anka so please Okay, Christina, just open the microphone, please. Yeah, uh, I would have a question, but for uh, Felix <laughs> regarding the server. Uh, it's uh, open source or you can just only, I mean, only you, the, um, the people that works in the projects can uh, access the server or it's open source for everybody? I think for now on it is um, closed, but I'm not sure if um, at one point it's gonna going to be open for everyone. Anka, there you have to help me a little bit because yeah. So uh, Chronocarto has some parts which are open source, which is the archaeological material which is already published. So for now we are using it in the team in order to establish the publications, and then we'll make it uh, totally open everybody thank you I think you, can, you can look on the internet uh, type chronocarto uh, we say and um, you can find uh, quite a lot of projects there which are open sources thank now you. because they are a lot of databases with archaeological material especially from the celtic world mm -hmm. and italy france and italy okay thanks okay i think uh, gabi popescu wants to make a comment because I've seen your microphone open before, Gabi. Did you hear us, uh, Gabriel? So probably it's an internet oh. connection problem. For... Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, just uh, following the same lines as uh, Christina, uh, do you consider when you're going to finish your publications or I mean your work, uh, do you consider to share your, um, especially the maps and the results with uh, on one of those um, <clears throat> sharing repositories like uh, GitHub or Zenodo or uh, OSF? Because that will be <clears throat> even more, <clears throat> that will be very easy and actually easier for uh, everybody in the field to uh, use your data or to replicate or to reproduce your results and to even uh, use them further in their own analysis because sometimes when um, using just your uh, research site or your research website it, it's more difficult in time to uh, continue to take care of it so these uh, large repositories these large database repositories can be of very good help in the long run um for now and they, uh, are free. We, and, mm -hmm. and they are also free mm -hmm. so they are free for um, 
to use and they're also most of them free for the universities or research centers to post those uh, results thank you very much for the suggestion so uh, uh, for now, we decided to put it on this site in order to be just for people in the team. But then, uh, of course, uh, we hope to, to, to finish the publications uh, for what it was done in the French and the German and for the first French project until uh, 2021. And then uh, 2021, if we can go on the field, it would be the start of uh, new things. So we'll see at that point. Uh, but yes, of course, I fully agree with you and thank you for the suggestion. I'm not aware of this uh, um, different things. I know better the historical database like Pleiades and so, mm -hmm. but um, of course, because this got, is what I would have, like yeah. to do in any case if the others agree. You've got great results and it will be great if you can, if you can share them with uh, uh, many other researchers. <clears throat> there are not uh, many geomorphological projects in the northern Aegean until now, uh, and uh, the other projects are in Macedonia, so in the region of Thessaloniki and so on, and all the rest of the coast is still uh, unexplored. There are geological works in Samothrace, the island which is in front of um, uh, Ainos, but um, not so much. So, this, uh, yeah. Thank you. Okay, I will have a question for uh, both Anka and Felix uh, concerning the tectonic structure of the region. Because uh, if we look at the um, Evros Delta general configuration, it seems to fill a uh, former old and large uh, graben, so like a negative feature. But uh, after that, the general landscape in front of Ainos to the sea, generally with that mixture of uh, beach ridges and lagoons, uh, which is quite a complicated maze with labyrinthic aspect, seems to have um, a uh, fragmented area by several forts, probably minor forts, but with uh, affected very much the level because uh, when you looked after the harbors, uh, you got this problem of uh, shallow water depths, like one, two meters instead of more, like four or five. And um, yeah, it's probably that um, the coring places, which uh, using that technique of uh, percussion corer on uh, firm land, um, could intercept generally different surfaces which are um, stable or even uh, even slightly uplifted because you've seen uh, in the left and right sides of the Ainos there are several marine terraces, which is a proof that uh, there are also some subsiding areas like this graben, which is uh, now the Evros Delta, but also some uplifting areas. So it's uh, probably a very complicated structure and I'm curious if uh, from the geophysical data and coring data that you got, you, you can say more about this uh, microtectonic structure of the Ainos area. No, it is something which must be completely done. The tectonic data we have are only general, so for the Asia, Asiatic plate. What we know from uh, historical sources is that it's a very strong uh, tectonic region. I know, of course, we are near Istanbul and the Straits, uh, but we there is no study. The Turkish people made some studies in the Marmara region and to the Kherson Essos, but there is absolutely no study and we did not look at the geophysics from this perspective until now. So it's absolutely to be done. Uh, but uh, Felix, some of your uh, um, ERT profiles, um, maybe they, uh, they took some signatures of some forts. Did you have also, let's say, longer ERT profiles, like longer than uh, three or four hundred meters? There. Longer than no, Felix uh, was not involved until now in Aino, so he is discovering this year. Uh, the geophysic profiles we did not have until now 300, 300 400, we had up to 200 meters. Mm -hmm. uh, but okay. the data are never were never inter interpreted in this perspective. There is a lot of data, there is uh, all the techniques we, we tried there. Uh, mm -hmm. um, we know that radar is not working, we tried the uh, at length in different parts uh, because of the um, argilla of the clay. Um, it's, um, then we did uh, quite a lot of magnetic, uh, electric and uh, also underwater all kind of techniques, but the data are not work yet. So, And in any case, there was no research in this perspective of the tetoni. So we should discuss with the field 
people in order to look for other topics. We are just focused, so we were just focused, they were focused, Helmut Brugner and Thomas Schmitz, on the finding the harbor until now. Okay, thank you. So please, are there other comments or other questions? You are invited to. <clears throat> okay, then I will make another question for you, Anka, and I'm still waiting for my colleagues to <laughs> um, to make also comments and uh, questions. Uh, so uh, concerning um, the, the Neolithic um, colonization there, you spoke um, and you show us some slides concerning uh, Oka Cheshme settlement, which is um, from 6,500 years before Christ. Um, so um, it, it seems to be uh, the first wave of uh, Neolithization which reached this area. And um, do you think there are several settlements placed on that border or with the same age on the um, right, right bank, on the western bank of the Hevros Delta? It was it, this this delta and this uh, this gulf in this period. Which it was probably a marine gulf for the Hebrews Delta. It functioned like a barrier for the Neolithization. Was uh, it? Uh, we don't know other settlements. Hoja Cheshme is the most important in Eastern Trace. Uh, it was well excavated by uh, the Turkish archaeologists, and it's a huge fortification. So it's very impressive for the seven millennium. Uh, uh, BC, the dimensions of the fortification. We do not know why they were not settled uh, closer to the sea than uh, it's 2.5 meters from uh, kilometers from the actual coast. We know that they settled there because they had dried food, so it's a plateau and they had fair, fresh water. This is the same rivulet which brings water to Ainos until today. So during the whole history, we had water pipes, you know, bringing water for there. Even today, people go there and drink and the water pipes bring water from there. So, um, yeah, it was a good point. We don't know why they, not, they do not settle near the sea. But of course, there are many parallels in Anatolia where they do not settle on the sea. And we have no information about something similar, uh, very close to the Hebros in Greece until now. Uh, also, we don't have in, in, in St. Inos no shirt earlier than uh, uh, Calcolithic. Said Bashan uh, tells that he found Calcolithic. The shirts we examined together are uh, Bronze Age from the city itself. So the Neolithization from the ceramics, it was established that uh, this uh, there we have in this Hocha Cheshme settlement uh, different waves. So some uh, are coming from Anatolia, from southern Anatolia, but also another wave is coming from the Balkans. So the sea, the, the sea Gulf was no barrier. In fact, they were just crossing in uh, south from uh, Kipsela, from Hipsela today, where is the crossing also today. And uh, yeah, it was uh, on the way between the two um, uh, between the two regions, so the southern Anatolia and then the Balkan region, which was also a center important in the. Um, Neolithic culture. For this, mm -hmm. it's um, Said Bashan made uh, one or two articles, and uh, I'm not a specialist, and I could not see the ceramics. So the fortification, the, the place can be visited today, but uh, I'm just repeating what is already published. But no other site in the region is known. Okay, thank you. So, if there are other questions from the audience. Maybe it was not so clear. I'm sorry if it was. No, no, in my opinion, it was very clear with a lot of information. No. Um, okay, Christina, please. It's more like a curiosity. Uh, does the situation from Histria is uh, similar with uh, that from Ainos, with the harbors and? Uh... Yeah, the the it's a good question. In any case, uh, Freddy established that and Luminita that there is um that there is an island. There was an island in uh, Histria which was connected. Then uh, through an isthmus, yes, we can compare the two situations. Uh, then the big, uh, also one can compare the existence of a big maritime gulf, which is near the mouth of the river. But uh, the river was uh, 
maybe uh, in any case today it's closer in Ainos uh, than uh, uh, than in history. Yeah. So uh, Ainos uh, certainly could easily dominate all the mouth of the Hebros. So we imagine this evolution, as you could see, uh, as a um, big uh, gulf which evolved then in Roman times in a two arms river with a very sandy, shallow water in the middle. And uh, yeah, so in Greek times, we know that Ainos was the only one to control this. On the opposite side, it was just a military frurion, a corion, a small fort called Doriskos, which was a, um, a then developed in later classical and Hellenistic time, a small city, but everything was controlled from Ainos. Uh, then uh, the difference, of course, is that um, the Hebros uh, was a very important um, navigation line because uh, um, Greeks were taking metals from Trace and uh, they were bringing this through the Hebros. So we have uh, quite a lot of uh, settlements which are really important uh, in Greek and Roman times on the Hebros basins. And all these metals and what was going from Athens, Samothrace, through Ainos to Trace was passing through Ainos. So we have here really like uh, the checking point, the major checking point for Eastern Trace. The traffic was important uh, also for slaves. So we have a lot of historical information about the uh, slaves and it's the same route. So coming back, coming down from Trace from the whole basins through Ainos, then stopping some of Trace in front and the island in front and then uh, going to Athens. And uh, also very important connection between Anatolia and the Balkan Peninsula. All the navigation routes were passing in front of uh, in front of Ainos. So uh, historically speaking, of course, the Northern Aegean is much more intense uh, historically and archaeologically than the Black Sea. Um, but then, yeah, of course, the city can be compared with history as controlling being the main uh, Greek center at the mouth of the river. This question of Island and Gulf, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Anka, um, the callings uh, could establish the moment when uh, was um, was established the first coastal barrier, which closed the mouth and uh, the lagoon. And uh, when Thank was this you. moment? This is also a, a question still to be established. We have a lot of cores, but they are not analyzed. Uh, so um, yeah, it's uh, still to be uh, to be done. What the, the only um, result we have until now is the existence of the two possible harbor basins. So mainly the harbor which was there also until uh, modern times on this Dalian Gölü. I can show you again the, the map maybe. Yeah, please. Yeah. So, um, sorry, my computer takes some time. So yeah, I was telling you about the river. So we have all this basin of the Marita with all these tributaries which come uh, here. So Edirne Adrianopolis, a uh, very important uh, site, but the Plovdiv also in Bulgaria and so on. And all this uh, was coming to, to Ainos. And here is Samothrace, uh, uh, here is Imbros, and here is Tassos. So the island of Samothrace functioned like uh, the uh, the pillar of a bridge between Ainos and then the Balkanic um, uh, region. I'm trying to show uh, you uh, the evolution uh, here, what we imagine. So you can see here, we think that in Neolithic and then uh, Calcolithic times, you can see here Hocha Cezme, it's very near to the coast. We imagine that it was an island and this, the course which Felix are, is analyzing uh, right now, uh, confirm finally we have the geomorphological proof that this was an island, at least in 4000, uh, uh, 3000 uh, BC. Uh, all this maritime gulf, therefore, here a valley that still needs to be investigated. Uh, and then um, uh, Greek times 
from text, I have reconstructed this, but we have no cores here. We have to drill and to establish this. And um, that the, the, the river is felt uh, here, but not passing Doriskos. We know from the Greek text that here it's still the sea. And uh, here we have the necropolis, uh, so it should be dry land in 5000 BC. And this is confirmed now by the drills and also the geophysics we did there. Harbor embayment, I, my hypothesis is that the harbor was always situated here. And then here are secondary harbor embayments. What is interesting for what I noticed by studying this harbor is that uh, they choose the most protected position because when you are here you are protected by the promontory by the acropolis here the higher region and uh, of course by these two mountains otherwise the wind coming from hebros and for this we have a lot of greek poetry and so is terrible is the terrible wind of the north boreas uh, very strong here so the protected area by some heights here and the heights here was chosen as the main uh, uh, harbor. And then also we have to check to study the delta and to, to, to check all this is hypothesis. I have done this after Strabo, who says that the river has two branches. We have information about earthquakes. We have information about uh, uh, inundations. Uh, so for example, in Pliny, we know that the river changed its course and it was a big catastrophe and all the uh, agriculture was destroyed in Ainos. Another important topic which are which we try now to, to finish uh, and to publish um, and on which Felix is working um, is this uh, water here from so uh, and passing also taking also the sources from Hoja Cheshme, uh, this rivulet which developed itself a delta here. So the situation this was discovered by Helmut Brunner in the drills because we had delta sediments quite well before the arriving of the Hebros, so we have two deltas. This delta was covered finally by the Hebros delta, and this is a topic we are trying now to clarify through uh, more drillings and dates. Uh, then here the um, cordons uh, are still hypothetical. We we drill, but we did not do uh, OSL, so we should uh, we should clarify here. All this remains to be done. What we know is that uh, in uh, Roman times. Uh, uh, Ainos was very important for uh, some species of uh, uh, fishes. It was uh, renowned. It appears in classification of the most uh, famous fishes uh, in imperial times. Uh, and uh, probably it has a saline. So in order to preserve this uh, fish and to export it. And uh, the salines are presented in uh, Genovese times, Byzantine and Genovese times, as the biggest resource of the city. And this indicates that until Byzantine times, this was closed and we have salines here until the maps of the 18th century. Then this was done after the maps of the 18th century. In the 18th century, already the harbor here became impossible. They went outside and the cordons, this is proven by the map of Choisel Gouffier, which was also the first map to use longitude and latitude. So the first, let's say, modern, real geographical map uh, in the modern sense. The harbor outside, and then they move the harbor even farther from the river mouth. Thank you. It's really very interesting this um, reconstruction, which in the first phases uh, is uh, mainly based on the historical sources, as you said. And um, in my opinion, I will be very, very curious about this small delta of the Hocha Cheshme. Which um, which reached the Gulf before the Hebros River, uh, because it will be a um, sedimentary archive uh, very suitable, even for the antiquity, but even for the Chalcolithic and Neolithic times, which uh, may prove or uh, give evidences about the strengths of the Neolithic habitation in that place, and could be also a proof it, if it was only that settlement which was discovered, Hocha Cheshme, or maybe several on the on the Hocha Cheshme watershed river. Yeah. You are right, Freddy. So, but uh, for now, from uh, palynology and charcoal, we have here a signal. You see deforestation mm -hmm. and charcoal in uh, Neolithic times, the starting of Neolithic, and then uh, this uh, modification. So we, but uh, we have to 
have another dream for Ludmila Shumilovsky in order to prove. So she sees a human impact, possible human impact, but it still needs more data in order to be sure to differentiate it from the evolution from the climate change. But it's possible to have the Neolithic impact here. And in any case, uh, we have the start of eutrophication before the Greek time. So in Neolithic, uh, Calcolithic. Uh, okay, um, but uh, where exactly it was uh, made on? On what core position would Mila make this uh, Here. vegetation history? Here. Um, it is the south of the city, so here is the Acropolis, the city mm -hmm. and the Isthmus, and it's near this Tashal too. Uh, what we hope um, is to study with her uh, cores, which are from this part of the region, from the city, from uh, Galagulu, which is a natural reserve, and uh, the archives could be even better. Mm -hmm. um, the pollen diagram shows a very strong impact on the pinus. Um, even maybe the, the strongest impact was in the high period, so in the first wave of the of the. Um, Orleans colonization, but after that seems a recovery of Pinus uh, starting maybe quite soon, like uh, three, four century Anno Domini, like late antiquity. It's, um, it's uh, a little curious that it recovered so so fast, even during uh, late antiquity. Uh, yeah, it's uh, this evolu evolu evolution of the Mediterranean vegetation, which starts from uh, uh, Oak, uh, but then um progressively in byzantine times especially it goes to pinus uh, so mm -hmm. pine comes into oak okay I, I invite again my my colleagues to, to give their feedbacks on the presentation so. uh hello hi maria uh hello i'm sorry that i don't have an image also that you cannot see me and uh, i'm sorry for my english also it's possible that uh, make a few mistakes no problem we understand very well till now uh, thank you very much um yes my question is not a technical one um but i wanted to say a little bit of a feedback and um, i wanted to say that i'm very impressed for now with the with the amount of work and uh, especially with the amount of collaboration between these different uh, uh, science di scientific directions uh, i studied anthropology so uh, i don't have a background either in history or in archaeology but i'm very interested in it i'm a, a master's student in my first year uh, so what i wanted to say uh, because i i'm really grateful to uh, uh, to everybody that uh, managed to organize this kind of conference because I think it's very important for us as students to participate and to to have contact with the, with the international uh, research directions that are happening now. Uh, my question was uh, for Anka regarding uh, her motivation or uh, uh, how, how do you approach this kind of uh, decisions when you want to study something because I, I see that it's a work of a great scale of years and years is not something that is happening in a, in a short amount of time you need a lot of dedication and perseverance and also if she has some uh, some advices for us for people who are not uh, 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 f uh, fa familiar fam familiar uh, familiar is that mm -hmm. okay i'm sorry yeah uh, okay Thank you. Yes, if you have some advices for us, how can we get involved uh, through volunteer work or uh, how can we keep ourselves updated with the latest research directions in this kind of field? That was what? my question. Thank you very much. What is your uh, you. topic of study? Uh, at my master's is uh, cultural interfaces in antiquity, in antiquity and prehistory cultural interfaces so are you discussing ethnicity or uh, archaeological cultures or both uh, i think both uh, for what i see now this was the first week so uh, for what i see now there are uh, these two directions yes so it's uh, it's uh, introduction in archaeology and the other one it's uh, pure theoretics uh, yeah. yes but i'm still uh, i'm still uh, figuring it out yeah, great, great. This is a very difficult topic. So, 
my yes. advice is to um, to to go on excavations as much as possible to have a a large uh, area of excavations and of um, significant projects in which you take place and to look at people. So more you see in archaeology, like in geography, more you see the landscapes and the site, more you know after, of course, reading also a lot, attending conferences, but you have to see the, the sites and you have to see how people work together. Uh, my story is a little bit different because I started uh, so with classic history, archaeology excavated in uh, Romania and in Ukraine. Uh, and I started um, when I was a student with, um, uh, besides the Romanian excavation in Orgame, um, with an American excavation in Kherson Essos. And this is uh, the, the team of Joseph Carter was a huge team of hundreds of people working in Kherson Essos, so in Sevastopol in Crimea. And uh, there is how I saw how uh, works an international team with all kinds of competences. And there we were starting, of course, with aerial photos and study of the territory. And we had specialists of all kinds of fields. So uh, from geophysics, uh, paleobotanics, architecture, and uh, specialists of every type of uh, material, uh, and also historians and also people discussing together. So uh, one needs to go and see how this kind of, it takes time, but one needs to go and see how these huge teams are working. And of course, huge team and huge uh, amount of money <laughs> because mm -hmm. all this is uh, expensive. So the American teams know that it's over, the excavation was a good thing. But then, for example, as an advice, you could apply uh, and go on the excavation. For example, in Miletus is the German... Um, School of Archaeology, where you can see how Miletus. people... Yeah, in Miletus, Milet. Thank you. And Julian Berzescu knows uh, how to recommend uh, you there. And also, if you want, I, I can. Then Pergamon, it's another German excavation um, in Asia Minor. Um, uh, Limura, uh, also an excavation, but it's more archaeology. So going on the sites and uh, seeing all this um, together. Then... Um, in, uh, in order to fortify your theoretical background, uh, I recommend uh, to, to apply and to try to see uh, also other cultures, you know, to visit sites and to read about, to, to make comparisons with other sites. So I think especially of the pre-Columbian cultures and so on, if you want to have an anthropological um, uh, approach. So my, my approach is uh, bottom up. So always going on the site, only uh, seeing the material and making conclusions from the materials. Then you can take it also theoretically from the theory to the practice. It's more fashionable today, but it's not, um, in my opinion, it's not the solid thing. So I don't make the model and try to apply it. I go and see a lot of sites. I read the text. I study the uh, archaeological materials, all this uh, I do always with specialists, so text I do myself and maps. Uh, but if I have languages which I don't know, for example, when I work uh, on Chinese things and so, I always go to the specialist which, who knows the language in order to have access to the really the, the best source uh, possible. And also in archaeology, I go and work with the specialist of every category of material, geomorphologists, geophysicists, paleobotanists, paleozoologists, anthropologists. We have also in Aino somebody who is studying the, the bones. Now, I hope in the future we can develop these isotopes and so in order to see the migrations. It was not done, so it's something we hope. It will, uh, it will be done because it's very important. It's Neolithic and, of course, all these Greek uh, Roman times, it's a passage region, so we should know more about migration and so, as we know from the material culture, then what we, it would be the best, it would be to compare these different proxies, different types of sources. So you have the text which tells you that, for example, this site is in the middle of all the connective roads you saw on the Tabula Peutingeriana, it's a crossing road. Then we have the archaeological materials, which show which was the center of this crossing road. So we have material <coughs> from Athens, from Asia Minor, from the Balkans and so. Uh, and then uh, we should have also this anthropological mm -hmm. material with isotopes and uh, DNA, if possible, in order to see how people came uh, there. So all this we try to uh, bring together and to make another picture. So how to say, what to say, go and see the fields, start from the material and uh, yeah. and you are welcome in Ainos if you want.
Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I'm sorry that you cannot see me, but uh, I was really with my eyes wide open and uh, noting everything. Uh, it's uh, it's really impressive. And uh, yes, I'm sorry. I'm usually nervous when uh, uh, <laughs> for these kind of uh, questions and everything. But yes, thank you very, very much for your answer. So practice, 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 from what I understand. Visit, see Visit. a lot of things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you very, very much. And it was a pleasure to to listen to you. Oh, thank you very much. You're right. Thank you. Okay. So um, we are close by the finish of um, this seminar, but we still have time for a final question or comment, if you have. Luminica, <clears throat> please. Yes, uh, I would like to ask you about the architecture of the Greek and Roman cities, coastal Greek and Roman cities. Do you think uh, we can expect to find a pattern or do you think it is site specific? I mean, uh, do you think we can uh, find a relation between the position of the harbor and um, um, the position of the uh, sacred zone or uh, the economic zone or uh, of the residential zone uh, in this uh, coastal settlements. Mm, thank you. It's a very good question. And uh, I'm really interested in this because I try to find the pattern. <laughs> but then I see uh, that I think the patterns exist, but they are extremely complicated. So one has to take into consideration several uh, uh, lines of course the natural landscape of course I think uh, this is uh, um, in the theory because we are speaking about anthropology it was in the 20th century some uh, specialists of uh, pre-Columbian and Indian oceans and so um, uh, noticed uh, and created the concept of uh, landscape transfer this was created especially for botanics so uh, let's say how Europeans uh, transfer the European landscape with plants and animals into America and what they took there, there from there and created a new landscape in Europe. And uh, I was thinking that this concept of landscape transfer can be applied also to antiquity and it's something which interests me and uh, uh, for the natural setting, the natural pattern and uh, for architecture because um, the Greeks were looking for some landscapes which look like their homes. It, I, I believe in this. It's always uh, some settings about which they were knowing that uh, it will, will be uh, good for them. Of course, they are always, this we can see also from literature, they are always looking for fresh water, easy fresh water, connectivity. So the big river was not used uh, for water. It's always fresh water sources or smaller rivulets from the site. Uh, then uh, protected area, one needs uh, some mountain around there, especially when there are these uh, strong uh, uh, winds, then the good embayment for the harbor, all this we can know from literary sources. What the literary sources cannot be used for is when they tell you that the Greeks went to Delphi or to Didyma, they ask Apollo and Apollo said, you go and found your city, you'll, you'll find your create your city where the bird, the blue bird <laughs> will sit or where the pig will make a lot of small piglets. And so this is, of course, not the way they were doing the city. This is just, of course, a nomen, but uh, they were looking for a pattern they had in their mind and they could recognize. Of course, they were there were a lot of context before this, but still, um, they were knowing what to choose. Then one has to consider that in history they created a lot, hundreds and hundreds of uh, settlements which did not survive more than one, two generation. In this case, you cannot see anything with archaeology. Maybe with the drill, you can see some impact if they burned everything, but uh, in archaeology, you will not see anything. And in the Black Sea, when Pliny is speaking about 90, so almost 100 colonies from Miletus, one has to count of all these uh, settlements. So it's a big, uh, now we are starting to see in uh, archaeology before we are thinking the yeah, Greece came and they found it Histria, they found it Orgame, Boristene and so on. And there are some cities and they became big and so it was not like that. In fact, the Greeks in the Black Sea, especially uh, in the seventh century, they did not establish in big centers like they did in Italy. Uh, where they established in big centers in order to have contact with big centers, which were uh, Italic centers already there. On the Black Sea, they established in a lot of small 
um, settlement from which only some survived more than one, two generations. And these bigger uh, settlements, uh, some decay, as you can see also from Orgame, decay and history are remain big and so on. So it's a strong dynamic about the pattern. Concretely, yeah, it's a natural pattern. So looking for the situation of uh, island or all isle, old island uh, on uh, Isthmus, we have a lot of this, is Sisyphus, is Sinope and so on. Uh, then there is um, a regional, cultural regional pattern. So for example, Ainos uh, should look like other cities on the Northern Aegean. This is why I compared with uh, Tassos. So, uh, because um, this, uh, let's say, regional cultural uh, pattern is determined uh, also by the people who are living there and who are knowing each other and who are developing, let's say, uh, regional culture, um, but also by the economic function of the settlement. So Tassos also was a center with uh, raw resources on the island, but also a very important trading center between Trace and uh, the Greek world. So I know the same. So this is why I would compare and I would put the harbor near the Agora because this was the purpose. It's an economic center. It's a um, uh, trading center, a hub. So uh, it's this uh, regional, uh, regional pattern. And then, yeah, you have historical events uh, and coming of some people. You could have also an ethnic cultural pattern. Uh, some populations have their cultures and they come and they create something in their own style. So I think there are several, I would say natural, then cultural, regional, and then uh, also historically, ethnical. But uh, yeah, and it, it's, a, it's a topic which should be developed in a bigger project. Uh, not only for uh, but bringing together so these things of natural stuff, uh, our architectural things, and also paleobiology, paleoecology. Uh, because, um, for example, uh, I would be interested uh, to work with people who are interested in uh, seeing better, um, in my opinion, the, the, uh, the olives and the wine were, were spread all around the Mediterranean by the Greeks. So, um, you know, today when in French geography, when you define what is the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean is uh, olive and wine. Uh, well, I think if this is Mediterranean, then the Greeks made the Mediterranean. And I would be very curious, for example, to work with somebody who in developing techniques in order to be able to identify the wild from the domestic, so to say, olive, or to see uh, statistically how the if the this can be checked by geomorphology that the olives spread with uh, with the Greeks because the barbarian populations from text we know that um, they were using animal fat while the Greek for example the Greek did not eat del dolphin people from the Black Sea were eating dolphin fat and for the Greek this was horrible because dolphin was a sacred animal and so on so yeah this is also a kind of landscape transfer Oh. Okay, thank you, Anka. So um, we are at the end of the seminar. Thank you, everybody, for um, being with us today and with Anka. And of course, special thanks for Anka for this um, wonderful presentation. And I just uh, remind you that uh, probably in the next spring, um, Anka will join us. Uh, so we'll be physically in uh, Romania because we'll have a common field campaign at Novio Dunum. And uh, I hope it will be a good opportunity to have another seminar to, to be invited again, but uh, that time uh, to be a face-to-face -face, uh, seminar and an opportunity to can discuss more and to know better um, Anka and uh, her, her interests in um, archaeology and geoarchaeology. So thank you once again and um, see you see you soon. Goodbye. Thank you very, very much. And uh, if you have any questions or anything, uh, I'm fully available. Do not hesitate to write. Yeah.